Well, that's sort of the other part of like, you, you kind of, it, it's just a paragraph, but you count that, that um, this kind of conversation or this meeting in, the, in a church and there's this political rivalry that culminates with guy coming in and killing the, or shooting the other guy. Like, I, I think it's Broderick that is only getting wounded. He's not killed per se. Um, yeah, the, but it's the, in, in part I'm kind of like, sorry, yeah. especially in modern times, there's always come this conversation of like, oh, we should have guns everywhere, and you can take out the um, the assailant, and it, it kind of like what they did in the Wild West, and it's like we are in the Wild West here, uh-huh. and apparently no one had guns. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's a there's a kernel of truth to the otherwise dramatically overblown depictions of the lawless Wild West. Um, Like you say, in this one episode, a guy pulls a a gun in in a church where a political convention is taking place. But um, gun control in parts of the Old West was a lot stricter than it is today. I mean, in some towns, you actually had to check your firearms with the local sheriff before Mm -hmm. you entered the town. Um, If we, We could learn a thing or two from the Wild West, I think. And I think I, in my Atlantic book, I think there's this, I have this one episode where an individual actually joins like a committee of public safety, I think in San Francisco. So mm, yeah. you do have these kind of quote unquote policing bodies that um, try to keep law and order in place too. Yeah, yeah. And there's a long vigilante tradition in, in, uh, in California in particular. Which kind of leads to the other point of like, uh, considering we have church shooting against one of the candidates how much how much violence are we seeing during the during political campaigning in the west and maybe in comparison to like the rest of the country too yeah um it was uh violence was an effective political tool all over the united states um in california it was often deployed against republicans i mean republicans had a dismal time of it in california in the 1850s Ironically, it's it's Fremont's home state or adopted home state, and he does terribly when he runs for president uh, under the Republican banner in 1856. Uh, California just returns almost no votes for him. Um, and that's partly because um, Democrats and, and white vigilantes of all sorts uh, uh, mobbed Republican meetings. Uh, it was dangerous to be a Republican. It was dangerous to be openly anti-slavery in California to the extent that the Republican Party in California even nominated a slaveholder for governor. Uh, that, that's how effective the, the pro-slavery message was, that they didn't feel comfortable uh, nominating somebody who was more openly anti-slavery. So the guy actually owned a slave in North Carolina. <laughs> that That is, um, but I think it speaks to um, I can't remember who I think it was may have been Luke Ritter's book on like nativism. Um, and it's like, he makes a similar kind of case of like, when we think of the American party, it's it's much more complicated than the simply, they're just anti-immigrants where they eventually embrace like in the Western parts of the Midwest, like immigrant voters, because they're they're good immigrant voters versus yeah, yeah. others that are not. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, you you and just construct the candidate, the, the programs to fit your political needs, right? Exactly. 